Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from InvestorStream, and I'll be your host today. This morning, we have Melbana Energy Executive Chairman, Andrew Purcell, who's gonna be providing us with an update on the drilling program for its two high impact exploration wells in onshore Cuba in its block nine contract area, those being Alameda one and Zapato one. Following the presentation, Andrew will be available to address any questions you may have. We'll attempt to get through as many questions as time permits. Please feel free to send in your questions via the chat platform in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you can also email them to me directly, alex at investorstream.com.au. You would have seen in the chat, but you've, um, you've also got an opportunity to download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. And I understand the presentation is lodged on the ASX and if it's not up there, it'll be up there very shortly. Finally, a copy of the webinar will be available on Melbourne's social media platforms later today. But for now, I'd like to throw it over to Andrew, who's gonna kick things off for us. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Alex. And thank you everyone for your time this morning. I've put together a couple of updated slides that I think people are probably most interested in, in hearing about, but the rest of the material uh, that we can talk to, depending on where the questions go, are in the document that uh, was released to ASX a short while ago, which hopefully you can see. Um, but on the front page is a picture of uh, drilling as of uh, a day or so ago. Uh, the guys are up and going and uh, the, the drill bit's turning and the uh, rate of penetration's been very good uh, thus far. But um, why don't we page forward, please, Alex? Uh, standard disclaimer, thank you. The corporate overview, I think um, probably everyone on this call knows who the personalities are. Um, the drilling operations update slide here, I put together a few slides uh, with regards to the update. We've uh, Monday morning kicked off. Uh, the rig uh, started working and it uh, has been running continuously since with a few uh, pauses. Typically when you erect these machines and, and you start them running after transporting and putting them in place, there's a process called a a shakedown, typical of any mechanical equipment where things <laughs> start to lock in place or maybe strain a bit and that cause a few delays uh, here and there. But uh, generally we've been very pleased with the performance of the rig uh, and it's a very experienced crew. I mean, you know, not only uh, the, the supervisors that we have at Melbana responsible for the drilling operation who have worked for many major oil companies in the region and around the world over many decades, um, but the Sherrod crew, uh, who are actual guys on the rig and know the rig, um, work like clockwork. They've drilled hundreds of wells together in Cuba over the over the decades, some of them. Uh, and so they know what they're doing and need very, very little in the way of instruction. You know, our job is just to keep the materials to them, uh, the fuel supplies, the fluids, the, the casing, as you can see on the bottom right there, it's all laid out, the current casing ready for loading up onto the rig. We've had uh, a good flow of deliveries into Cuba over the last month or two. We had a, another big arrival on the weekend. Well, not us, Schlumberger, uh, who's one of the subcontractors we're using for this drilling program. They had 14 containers arrive in the port of Marial uh, on uh, on Saturday, I think it was. That's the, that's the principal port we're using just to the west of Havana and uh, the, the best operational port available for, in our opinion for this sort of work on the north coast. So the shipping has been a real challenge. It has been one of the things that has uh, stretched our imagination and problem solving skills the most over the last couple of months. It's, it's not a particular issue with Cuba. The world's shipping uh, and logistics chains are incredibly trained uh, at the moment, as I'm sure you, many of you have read elsewhere, and shipping frequencies and uh, are unreliable and they get changed and bumped at a better payer and containers particularly are in short supply around the world. And one of the big hubs for us in the Caribbean is uh, the Port of Cartagena in Colombia. And, and it's just a it's just a zoo down there by all accounts. The containers are backed up for miles and the loading and unloading of ships is taking longer than expected. But, you know, we've allowed for that. Um, we've um, had a few sleepless nights, but things, um, as they say in the theatre, have been right on the night. You know, stuff has arrived. 
in the nick of time in some cases, uh, but we had contingencies in place and uh, we're good now. You know, we're good. Uh, the last major shipment we have is some more casing arriving next week, but we're not going to require that casing, uh, the current projections for many weeks yet. So uh, things are things are proceeding as well as we could have expected at this stage. Perhaps uh, next slide then, please, Alex. Uh, we know we concluded an entitlements offer um, recently for this drilling program. So that was an underwritten rights offer, um, entitlements offer. It, um, it had good shareholder participation and you know, with many of our shareholders uh, applying for additional shares under the, under the facility. Um, which we allocated uh, before putting anything to the sub underwriters. Uh, so the money that was raised uh, has been raised in full uh, because of that underwriting from Canaccord is earmarked for meeting our remaining obligations for this two well drilling program in Cuba. Uh, as we're running now, um, you know, a lot of the money's been spent already uh, to get to this point and purchasing you know, inventory and equipment uh, but you know, we're, we're on budget as things stand at the moment and the monies that we raised have got a contingency built in for the remainder of the drilling program. So we're well funded to meet the remainder of our share of obligations for this drilling program now. Um, the options that were attached to the offer, they have been listed on the ASX with ticker MAYO. So they're exercisable at three and a half cents uh, for a year up till 10 September 22 of next year. So the, you know, the, the idea behind that is, you know, if we have a success in in Cuba, then that would be a, a way, or hopefully the share price would respond accordingly, as I'm sure we're all hoping. Uh, but that would be a way for the company to uh, raise additional funds at that time uh, without. Uh, yeah, at, a, at a significant premium to the current raising price, which may provide the additional funds that would be required in the event of a discovery to do the next stage of work that we would want to consider for a uh, appraisal of a discovery or perhaps you know more exploration in the block. I think that's a you know it's a bit premature for us. We're putting together plans at the moment uh, as to what would happen in the event of a discovery, what we would do next. Yeah, the obvious answer is we would put uh, you know a, a discovery into flow test uh, immediately to to see how it's performing, the reservoirs performing. Um, depends where the discovery is too, of course. You know, in the Alameda one well, um, and maybe it's easier for me to talk to the slides which showed that imagery, Alex. If we go on um, a bit more, just on the timing of the wells. You know, just a summary for people that who are looking at this afresh or uh, wondering what Melbourne has got ahead of it. Uh, in summary, we've got these two main opportunities before us now, the Cuban drilling program that I was just talking about. That's now, that started, 236 million barrels of oil is what we're going for at a prospective best estimate resource. We're 30% of that at Melbourne, so it's a very significant play, um, particularly for a company our size. But then next year, we've got um, expectations of a well being drilled offshore Northern Australia, the Beehive prospect. That's a massive, massive prospect. And we're very excited to have a very substantial you know, US Fortune 500 company uh, that has purchased that permit, drilling that well. We believe next year, they're certainly working with their ears pinned back at the moment on their environmental and permitting. Uh, and rig selection to be able to do that. Uh, but yeah, we'll have a, a very significant uh, interest in a discovery there with a royalty payment if that were to be successful. But we have nothing more to pay <coughs> for that well. Uh, you know, with a purely royalty interest and contingent cash payments coming our way if it's successful. Uh, so the next page, please, Alex, will give a runway of the timing of these opportunities for Melbana over the next year. Um, I've put a little red line there in September 2021. If you look at the date um, chart, you know, that's where we are now. And we will run this 2L program through Cuba probably until about, you know, first end of first quarter next year. 
um, is the projected run rate. Um, we then may have um, a little bit of news in the middle of the year. Uh, we have a small royalty interest in a well that Santos is drilling up in the Ashmore Cartier region in Australia. Um, again, nothing for us to spend there. So it's, it's purely a royalty interest if they're successful. Uh, not at the same scale as Cuba or um, our Beehive prospect, but it's you know it's another another opportunity for us to have uh, a, a bit of a an interest in the success. And then the EOG drilling program on Beehive is currently uh, we are informed uh, working to be done in the back half of next year. And so that you know gives us from now until the end of next year a pretty exciting runway of opportunities of, of very material scale uh, in oil, we think, at least in the EOG Beehive prospect. And the options that you have um, received as part of the raising would uh, expire in September of 2022. So that's um, there's a lot of optionality around the timing of that option expiry there, uh, obviously from the results of Cuba and and, and the Santos well, but you know probably occurring right on the cusp of you know the drilling of the Beehive well too. Um, Alex, if I go, if we go to the next page, and I'll just finish off on that point I was making earlier in that top left diagram for this first well Alameda that we're drilling in Cuba at the moment. Um, you have three targets there. And I was mentioning what our development scenarios may be in the event of a discovery. Well, the main game with Alameda is, is the bottom target, the Alameda prospect, as it's labelled there on the top left chart. And that's the one that had you know, good previous recoveries of, uh, of uh, a much lighter crude than is typical in Cuba. But there's two targets on the way down, the U1 and the N target. Now, if we, uh, if we find something in either of those to secondary prospects on the way to the main game, well, we're going to just keep going, you know, with the, with the rig that we have in place and its capabilities and the costs, we'll just keep going down to the final target. And if the final target is a success, you know, that's, and we have more than one success, then it's a high class problem. But if it's the bottom target where we have the successes, we hope, well, then that goes on to production testing. And with that oil, if it, you know, flows at a commercially uh, justifiable manner, you know, we can we can start uh, putting that oil into the market very quickly where we are in Cuba. You know, initially, probably, you know, we would just truck the oil uh, to the nearest port in Matanzas, uh, the deep water port, uh, an oil terminal. Uh, and in time, we would, uh, you know, put in more permanent uh, ways of distributing that oil. There's a pipeline nearby, there's a rail line nearby. They're all options. But in that discovery scenario, with an Alameda discovery, using that revenue, we would then, you know, it's a huge block, block nine. There's prospectivity all the way along it. So the next step for the partners, and we would decide is, you know, do we do appraisal wells on the discovery or do we maybe acquire some seismic using the revenue we're generating from the wells to acquire some seismic to better understand these features where we've had the discovery. Um, but if you want to end were to be the success, then we'll take a step back and go back up and perforate the wells at that point and do uh, the flow testing on them. So lots of scenarios starting to, to form part of our weekly management meetings with our partners now that the guys on the ground have got the keys and, and are drilling. I, uh, I think that's probably a, a, a good and brief introduction to where we are today. And I would be happy to talk more on any particular point that anybody had some questions on. If I might just pause here for a moment, Alex, to see if there's uh, anything I should address more particularly. Yeah, uh, Andrew, just uh, we, we have had a quite a swathe of, of questions come through already, um, and we'll probably save a few of them for the end. I, but I guess one that's come through is, uh, can you comment on the potential impact of COVID on operations? Well, it's been um, something that's weighed very heavily on our minds uh, uh, with respect to operational planning, of course. Um, it has got the potential to interfere, you know, borders closed, quarantines, but we've put in place a lot of contingency um, around this and you know, we have 
you know, isolation for our crews um, before they are admitted on to the well site. We have a doctor on site administering antigen tests and then PCR tests if they show positive. Um, and Cuba itself has got a pretty dynamic um, uh, quarantine system and also vaccination program. They've had, um, they've had, you know, the numbers have been high-ish, um, but as of late, they're, they're starting to really go the other way you know, as the vaccine starts to get well distributed in the population. So it's something that still has got the potential to be a disruptor for our program, absolutely. But I think our contingencies are as good as can be expected for managing that risk. Thanks, Andrew. We'll we'll probably deal with uh, two more questions, and then I'll let you continue with the um, with with the presentation. Um, can you just talk us through the reporting process as this drill program unfolds? Well, what we have is a our target depth for Alameda is you know we've we plan it to be at up to four thousand meters. So depending on the rate of penetration that we get, we're thinking that the drilling to that total depth is going to be somewhere in the order of 10 to 12 weeks. Um, we are probably going to initially just give drilling updates, or unless we you know, have some good news, of course, in which case we'll announce immediately as we must and want to. Uh, but otherwise, if it's just routine drilling, then we'll provide updates to the market. We're thinking at this stage every other week uh, with data on the rate of progress and how things are going operationally. That's the current plan, but that's subject to change. And uh, and how long is the program likely to take for the first well? Well, 10 to 12 weeks is, is our current projection. But, um, you know, we have to make a lot of estimates based on the types of uh, formations we're going to be drilling through and their rates of penetration. So, as I said, we've started. We've got a couple of days of data under our belt. That's very good, uh, the rates at which we're going at the moment. Uh, but there'll be different formations soon. And, you know, we'll have to wait and average it out and update those estimates as we go. But, you know, there's three targets. Um, if it's 12 weeks for the drilling program, as we estimate, estimate and those three targets are, you know, pretty much equidistant, let's say, um, then, you know, maybe we would expect to be into the first formation early next month, early October, and then similarly into the end formation a month after that, and then the Alameda formation, you know, sometime in early December. That's That's the expectation. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we've we've still got a, a plenty of questions to uh, to go through, so we'll probably leave them to the uh, end of the presentation. If you want to continue, okay. I, I really think the questions are probably going to be more relevant for people than the presentations, Alex. So um, the rest of it's material that's on the website and that people have had a chance to look at, and we can go to those pages particularly if if someone asks a question in that direction. So why don't we continue with the uh, questions? Sounds great. So uh, I guess the um, the underwriter had a large number of shares placed with them. You mentioned that um, early in one of the previous slides. 143 million of the 356 million on offer. Can you just confirm if the underwriter has been able to place these shares and if any remain to be placed? Yeah, the offer was fully underwritten by the underwriter who in turn had um, well an, an excess of commitments from sub-underwriters. So all of those shares were placed to institutions uh, immediately at the closing of the offer. And also based on the ASX advice, the Mayo options held including uh, number one, HSBC with 118 million plus number five, HSBC with 18 million. Does this mean that HSBC has become the major shareholder in, in Melbourne and how might this affect operations and decisions in the future? No, these are options. So they're not a shareholder yet because they hold options. They have to exercise the options to become a shareholder. And those holdings of HSBC, HSBC, they're nominee accounts. They're not the actual holder of the options. They'd be holding those options on behalf of another party. And they're different nominee accounts, you know, those two HSBC accounts. So you shouldn't aggregate them uh, when looking at the, the significance of that position there. Thanks, Andrew. Can you just give me a little bit more detail on the historical wells in Cuba that you've referenced in the in the deck, in in a recent deck? Yep. Uh, well, the, the slide that's perhaps still on your screen that you can look at, the Marty Two and Marty Five wells that were drilled uh, twenty odd years ago. Uh, they were drilled um, by the Cuban National Oil Company, 
as as wildcats. You know, in those days, they had no seismic, they had no gravity. Uh, they just went out there and they stuck some holes in the ground, knowing, you know, at that time, there was evidence of oil, of course. You know, the Matembo oil field has been in that part of Cuba where we, in our block nine for 150 odd years. Um, the, you know, a, a, a favorite anecdote of mine that somebody in Cuba once told me was that the tar from that Matembo oil field was used to pave the streets of Manhattan back in the, the, uh, the late 1800s. So, you know, oil has been evidence. Spanish galleons used to use the tar to cork their ships, you know, in the port of Havana from these fields. So that's a, it's a prolific hydrocarbon zone. But, you know, what's the source? And, and that's, these wildcats tagged something and it was on trend from a very large discovery just adjacent to us called the Varadero oil field, which is an 11 billion barrel oil field. It was drilled and discovered on a gravity high um, and we, you know, similarly have done this work and we've got these same gravity highs. So, you know, these, these offset wells are very um, good data points for us, uh, but they're, they're a data point, you know, uh, that when we take it with the gravity, with the seismic, with the stratigraphy, when we look at the, uh, in total, what the prospectivity is and the justification for it, it it's, it's one important element of the thinking that designed our thinking as to where we would put these wells that we're now drilling. And just on the wells, Andrew, are the well depths different between Alameda 1 and Zapato 1? Yeah, a little bit. Alameda 1's a bit deeper. Um, it, as I said earlier, it'll probably go down to about 4,000 metres. We're allowing it to go to 4,000 metres. The crest of it is much shallower than that, but we don't want to, um, you know, be out you know, if we're wrong. Whereas the Zapato oil, which is the next slide, if, if perhaps you want to just go forward one, Alex, uh, the Zapato well is a much shallower crest, we think, uh, but a massive, massive, you know, it's a thousand meters vertical relief-ish, um, an enormous gravity anomaly. And, and indeed, you know, very closely offset with that Matembo oil field that I was referencing before, which produced an extraordinarily light crude uh, for Cuba. But uh, what's the kitchen? Where is it? Where did it come from? Nobody knows. And the previous offset wells in the case of um, Matembo, um, as you can see there, the Atabo, Bolonos, and Guadalajara, all, all, we can see from our analysis, we're all too shallow um, to, to hit what could have been the sources. So that's the reasoning behind the second well. Now, can you just provide some detail on the four zones that you're testing? Um, well, we've spoken about the NU and Alameda from the first well, and the, you know, these the formations that we have here in Cuba are called fractured carbonates. So they're very, you know, they're very gentle formations. You don't want to go in with a heavily overpressured drilling mud um, and treat it gently. Uh, and it'll respond well is the is the advice we've had from Sherrod and from QPET in dealing with these formations. So our guys know exactly how to treat these formations. Uh, and the fourth target, the Zapato target, the second well, which I've just spoken about briefly, is you know we have a we have a uh, no offset well. We have these volcanics immediately underneath the the oil field. Uh, these uh, um, ophiolites, as they're called, are not a source, the purple in that diagram, they're not a source of hydrocarbons. So, so yeah, this oil has migrated from somewhere below and probably deeper below. A lot of the oil in Cuba that is being produced currently comes at, you know, sort of the depths of where those volcanics are, you know, one to 2,000 metres. And, and they're, you know, so they're less cooked hydrocarbon, so they're heavier. They flow naturally, uh, unassisted, but they're heavier, lower API. Whereas so the thing that really caught our attention when looking at all the prospects was, you know, this this oil in Matembo was up to, you know, in the 60s API, an extraordinarily light crude. So our thesis is that, you know, something's coming from somewhere deeper and migrating up. And, and so it's got a better chance at those depths to be cooked out properly. and and as you looked at those two leads, there's a Pardo and A2 of the balance of those two proximate to where the oil has presented itself. We think the Zapato was the uh, 
the better option to go for in the first case. So Andrew, what's the mob and demob timeline between the two wells? Uh, two weeks we've allowed. Um, you know, the guys have got a pretty slick operation. Uh, they know their equipment. Uh, I don't think, and there's only 20 kilometers between the two wells. So I don't think two weeks will be necessary famous last words, <laughs> but just watching what they did and getting the camp and the rig erected at Alameda. Um, yeah, it was pretty impressive, but we're allowing two weeks. Now, you mentioned uh, some of the other participants in the drill program. Uh, I think Slumberjay was uh, was one of the, uh, the participants that you mentioned. How did the partic other participants in this drill program materialise? And can you give us some background on them? Do they have a history operating in Cuba? Yeah, we had to, as part of the conditions of our PSC, we had to run an international tender for all the contractors that were involved in this program and then assess and rank them and make the necessary selection. So look, the, the, the two principal contractors, that we selected a Sherrit, as I've already spoken about Sherrit, Canadian listed oil and gas company and nickel company um, that's been in country for decades, drilling oil and gas wells and mining nickel. So it's very well established and very experienced uh, you know, from an operational, regulatory, financial point of view in Cuba. Um, the other one, Schlumberger is well, well known to everyone in the oil industry. It's a massive international, multinational um, oil field services group and they also have had decades of experience operating in and uh, performing in Cuba. And so, yeah, we take great comfort from reliance on such two capable, experienced firms with uh, great logistics chains, problem solving abilities and resources that can be called in as and when they need it. The other contractors are, you know, necessary ones for any drilling program, but of, you know, less scale and significance like the you know the mud loggers and the you know the, the the samplers the field geologists and the cement providers and the fuel providers etc so they're all locals of course uh, to, to try and keep the logistics chains as simple as possible so just shifting to act a little bit when is work expected to commence on 488p and do you have any regular dialogue with the partner in that in that regard sure well i think maybe if you go a, a page forward, Alex, I think maybe the next slide um, from memory might have something on that um, for, um, as in that one. Thank you. Yes, no, we're in constant dialogue with EOG and they have been, um, you know, it's a great joy working with, a, you know, a big American oil company. They, uh, they want things done yesterday and that's the way we like to work as well. So it's been a good working relationship. Um, that program is going through the regulatory approval stages at a very satisfactory pace and we would imagine uh, that hasn't stopped them we've you know we've had a lot of meetings arranged between EOG and the necessary Australian regulators and government departments and that's all been well received having a, a company of this size enter Australia is a real boon for the Australian energy industry I mean I used to at the time we were announcing this transaction, we were, you know, keen to point out that you know EOG was twice the size of Woodside, uh, you know, well, otherwise Australia's biggest uh, oil company. But that's changed, hasn't it? With you know Woodside doing its corporate deal. So, but you know, it gives you an idea of the scale of the entrant of this entrant and their capabilities. You know, they have a lot of uh, experience in shallow water offshore drilling. They have. I might get the number a bit wrong, but it was, you know, one of the presentations they gave to the government here was they have 20, 26 uh, shallow water rigs offshore around Trinidad uh, that they've been operating for a number of decades. Uh, so they're very capable, very experienced people. And, you know, even though the permitting is and the licensing transfers and trained through the corridors of regulatory power in Australia, it hasn't stopped them. They've appointed their you know, environmental advisors, they're doing their rig selection work, they're doing their other, you know, people movement planning. Um, they want this thing drilled. Yeah. So that's, that's very exciting for us. It's very exciting for the regulators, you know, too. This, is, this prospect is a new type of play for Australia. But, you know, these isolated carbonate buildups, which is what the beehive is, hasn't been tested in Australia. But where it has been tested around the world, when it has worked, it has worked big 
And, and that's the reason for the dotted line around the high estimate um, that I put there in the prospective resource. It's very difficult. It's got a very funny shaped distribution, a very big tail. And so the best estimate that the independent consultants put on this was you know, 416 million barrels of oil equivalent. But if it works, it could be over a billion barrels of oil. So I think that's what got the attention of a company of the size of the OG. You know, for a country entry, this is big enough that if it's successful, would underwrite all the effort and expense to do a country entry. Now, coming into the, the drill program on block nine, why are the shares tracking at two cents? Yes, indeed, why? Traders um, have their own reason, investors have their own reasons. In my experience, uh, it's, a, um, uh, it's not a typical A in a, any entitlements offer or equity raise that the price at which you raise equity is the price where the share price tracks to over the course of the raising. Uh, it particularly is compounded in the case when you have equity being issued with options. Um, sometimes it's a common trading strategy or hedging strategy to, you know, recover the cost of the investment by selling the shares and hanging on to the options as the hedge against the success. Look, there's a million reasons, but people should remember that, you know, the volumes have been quite strong uh, since the close of the offer, even heading into the close of the offer. Uh, so people are getting themselves positioned as per their own portfolio and their own expectations. Uh, for every seller, there's always a buyer. And, you know, I think whether our share price is, you know, 1.9 or 2.1 or plus or minus, what we're all in this for is is the success case. And in the success case, you know, we, we would hope that this would deliver a very material uh, improvement in our share price to our shareholders. Now, just uh, just just back on the on the on the drilling program. When do you expect or estimate for the first target to be intercepted? Probably early to mid next month. Fantastic. So, and just around, you, you talked about the uh, the old um, Marty Two and Marty Five wellheads. Uh, what's the significance of oil at the surface around the old Marty Five wellhead? And similarly. Is there any uh, any significance to the visible oil spill at surface around the old Marty II wellhead? Well, it's a, it's it's no longer like that. But well, back then in 2000 and oh, whenever it was taken, I think it was 2003. Those photos were taken. Um, obviously, it was evidence of somebody not suspending the wells properly. Um, and you know, what's the significance of it? Well, it, you know, oil's there. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, of why we selected to drill where we're going to drill in block nine. The first well, Alameda one, is you know twinning those previous discoveries. Now, you know, from a purely uh, scientific point of view or an explanation of what's going on under the surface in Cuba, I think you know our geologists. And the board had a number of robust discussions as to what was the most interesting well from a scientific point of view to start with in Cuba. But being an ex-banker um, in resources, I sort of like what I think is, and as did my board, uh, as did our partners who signed off on it, um, you know, starting with a well that has the best chance of success is, is what you want to do in a drilling program. So that's why we started with Alameda and the significance of those oil seeps are you know, a, a bit of comfort and contribution to the thesis that what we're targeting is indeed a source of the hydrocarbons we want to find there. Now, shifting back to the Australian assets, has the company developed any leads in the new Australian block WA544P or NT slash P87? Yeah, we're working hard on that at the moment. No, we haven't finished our assessment work. We've done the seismic reprocessing. We've commissioned the seismic reprocessing in those blocks. Uh, that's well advanced. Um, you know, we hope to have um, that work completed and our assessment done of it probably, probably first quarter, end of first quarter of next year. You know, the, the idea is that, you know, we would like if we have to find 
prospects of interest in those two areas, which we think we will, that it is a nice running room for EOG or indeed for any other partner that may want to come in on the back of the beehive story, uh, knowing there's a well being drilled there next year and that similar prospects may exist over the fence. Uh, so we want all that work done and out there and looking for a partner um, prior to the beehive prospect being drilled next year. So I guess broadly speaking now, Andrew, now that you're drilling, can you just give us a bit of a feel for what the strategy is and has anything changed over the past six months that's made you to made you amend your strategy and how does the next six months look for, for Melbarna? Well, we've amended our strategy almost on a daily basis over the last six months with regards to Cuba and COVID and logistics challenges. But no, the big picture is let's get these wells drilled. And over the next six months, you know, we're going to know whether the effort in Cuba has been worth it. And if it is, then, you know, it's, an, it's a great time to be finding oil. Uh, the oil prices, you know, is, is, is in a great spot. The fundamentals of the oil market um, notwithstanding all the externalities of you know major suppliers turning taps on and off and global um, frictions and industrial capacities going up or down even with all of that noise the demand for oil looking forward um, according to the you know the, the, both the to governmental panel on climate change and the US um, energy uh, department is is only going to go up from now until 2050. Uh, so you have a lot of demand for oil in the future. You have very little investment continuing to go on in its discovery to replace existing reserves because the world shifted. You know, the world's heading towards a different energy future. And that means in our position and our belief there's a mismatch between supply and demand uh, which is underwriting the price of oil for many many years to come certainly in the period of time frame that everyone on this call cares about and as a result we hope if we can find something now we've got a good oil price environment and that's going to generate good margins which will underwrite us um, making a much better study of a much more extensive hydrocarbon system even within block nine let alone all of cuba um, that we can generate a new and significant source uh, approximate to major markets uh, for the long-term value of Cuba and our company. So what are the plans, if, you, if any, for the Santa Cruz prospect in Cuba? It's been on our to-do list and unfortunately we haven't wanted to get to it yet because of the focus on this work. Um, this has been what our partners paid for. This is what our shareholders have wanted us to do. Santa Cruz is a nice project to have up our sleeve in Cuba because it's a much quicker route to getting into production by doing some workovers and some you know, end of life work. But it's, a, it's the typical Cuban light and um, heavier crude and it's not of the significant volume that these opportunities are. So it's a, it's a parallel project for us. Now that this is underway, we can start to pay more attention to Santa Cruz. And I guess in a, in a similar vein, are there any other drilling prospects in Block 9? There's, there's many, you know, we've, we've, we've got a couple of dozen of them. Um, these are our, amongst our highest rated few that we're drilling at the moment. Um, we certainly know which ones we'd like to tackle next. But as I said, it'll depend on you know where we find oil and, and how much we find as to what we do next. You know the work streams will be dictated by that because I think everybody, uh, partners, shareholders, regulators, everybody is very keen to see oil production uh, as a priority. And and so once we've once we've established that, if we can, that that will dictate what we prioritise as the next step. Thanks, Andrew. Now, from a regulatory standpoint, how is Cuba placed and do you anticipate any hurdles now that you've commenced drilling? Um, from a regulatory, from a jurisdictional point of view, it's a very competent black letter law jurisdiction. We've had um, 
nothing but good experiences dealing with the Cuban regulators and the clarity of their permitting and laws. Our interest in the contract, the production sharing contract we have with the National Oil Company is actually uh, encompassed in national law. It, it's taken by their parliament and brought into the, the national law. So we have a lot of protections for our investment. And look, I've operated in a number of emerging markets around the world in my years and, and, and in a lot of developed markets too, might I say. And I find them all very difficult now to do resource projects, whether it's energy, whether it's mining, you know, because of the, the uncertainty of the regulatory process with the social license, with the environmental concerns, it makes it a moving target for knowing the time frame over which things can be developed often, and the, therefore the cost. Um, Cuba has been somewhat, you know, methodically slow in in getting from A to B. You know, if you need that permit, it's going to take you ten months, and it takes you ten months when, you, when it shouldn't have. But it's a reliable ten months. You know, it's, we've we've never had an issue getting a permit, we're doing everything to Western standards, of course, as we should and must as an Australian company. So all of the environmentals, all of the land access agreements, all of the drilling permits, uh, it's all very clear and it's all very easy to follow and it all happens like clockwork. So I'm, I find it a very good jurisdiction to be operating in. Thanks, Andrew. We've only got a couple more questions, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll uh, call it there. But uh, we've, like I said, just a couple more to get through. Can you just help us understand the geology of some of the targets that you're testing in this program, and what are the chances of success from your perspective? Well, I'm not a geologist, and I think my uh, fellow directors who are experienced geologists would be horrified if I put a chance of success on all of this. The chance of success in our Cuban drilling programs are determined independently uh, by uh, uh, an expert called McDaniels and Associates out of Canada who have a lot of experience in Cuba because of Share It. Um, so they, they've put a geological chance of success on the Alameda prospect, for example, of 32%. Now, you, you know, on average, Oil and gas exploration is a very risky business, uh, and the global average, in my in my experience of some of the materials I've seen and read, you know, the global average chance of success of an oil and gas well is in the low teens, you know, 12, 14 percent, something like that. So we've got something considerably higher than that, and that, and in no small part due to those previous discoveries, uh, which if they had been better documented at the time. You know, maybe we'd be talking about appraisal wells now uh, instead of exploration wells, but they weren't, and so they're exploration wells because of that data uncertainty. But the types of formations are, um, you know, they're just classic strat traps, um, as you saw from those large formations that provide that, you know, barrier to the migration of oils um, that we are targeting. So. Uh, Anything more than that is going to take me out of my pay grade from a geological understanding basis, and I don't want to have to ask answer harsh questions from my fellow directors. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, you now we we did talk briefly about um, the the reporting process as the drill program unfolds. Are there any restrictions to releasing mud logs and core samples which the Cuban regulators have, or is Melbourne able to report sampling results independently? Yeah, no, no, we haven't been told that we can't report anything. So we'll make the necessary announcements that we believe are, are consistent with our you know, continuous disclosure obligations and, and are relevant to the market in their assessment of how we're going. So you know, we've, you know, we're keen to share our knowledge and information as it's gathered, when it's gathered, on a, on a, on a frequency that you know, makes sense. Thanks, Andrew. And just one final question, unless there's, um, I mean, last opportunity to send through questions, guys, but last question that we've received. Um, has there been any interest recently in the Tassie Shoals project? And is this still a serious prospect for development? I, I, I like to leave that in my, in my top drawer because 
look, it's a long history, and you know, I know there'd be many shareholders still in this company um, who were invested for that project all those years ago. And the reason it didn't get to completion all those years ago was still the reason that it's sitting on the shelf now uh, is that it needs a gas supply. And it's look, it's got it's it's got all of its environmental permits to proceed. It's you know they're valid until the 2050s, which is an extraordinarily rare thing. Where does the gas supply come from? Well, you know, there's there's a lot of moving pieces happening there in Northern Australia. You know, with Santos, um, with, with Santos electing the, the the Barossa field to backfill Darwin LNG, and and now Santos and it sounds like E and I too with the Evan Shoal field looking to bring that gas on onto the beach at Darwin and strip out the CO2 and then pump it back up on the Bayou Wundun pipeline to sequester the CO2 uh, up in Timor Leste. There's a lot of moving pieces again, and you know it's one I I do keep an eye on. I do have conversations with the relevant players in the region. Uh, most recently at the APA conference in Perth a few months ago, we had some good chats on this. But the the delivery of the project is is out of our hands. It, but the piece that we need, I continue to have conversations about. So I rank it as a as a as a low priority for Melbana. In the, in the immediate future of what we have on our plate and what would deliver the most value for shareholders in the near term. But as, a, as an option, as a cheap option sitting in our drawer that maybe one day gets pulled out and surprises everybody, definitely has some value. Thanks, Andrew. Now that's all the time we have today. Um, thank you all for joining me. And well, hang on, we've just, um, sorry. Um, We've just had one of our attendees, uh, Andrew, who's who just joined late. Um, can you just confirm um, that there will be uh, weekly updates on the drill, during the drilling of Alameda uh, Alameda One, and how regular will those updates be? Well, uh, I, we did say earlier that at this stage I'm expecting to put out updates uh, by month. What was bi weekly? I mean twice a week or two weekly? I mean two weekly. Um, at and this stage, as we're going through the early stages of the drilling and then we'll reassess as it gets more, obviously, unless there's something more interesting that occurs, in which case we'll announce it as it is um, appropriate. Fantastic. So like I, like I said, Andrew, that, that's all the time we have today. Thank you all for joining me. I'd also like to thank Andrew for presenting and taking the time to answer some questions. We certainly got through a fair sway of the questions. So, um, so thank you very much for that. As I mentioned before, a recording of the webinar will be on Melbourne's social media platforms later today. Andrew, before I let you go, do you have any final comments to leave with us today? No, just thank you very much for everyone's time and listening to our story and the support. And we're very, very keen to, you know, deliver for our, our loyal shareholders and partners. So watch this space. Fingers crossed. Fantastic. Now, uh, I'll, I'll reiterate that if you are, if you were late or um, if for whatever reason you, you know an investor that uh, may have missed the, the webinar, there will be a replay available on Melbourne's social media platforms later today. Um, Andrew, thanks very much for joining me. That wraps it up here, everyone. Um, thank you very much and have a great day.